Hello and welcome to a special episode of the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. As we mentioned on the last two episodes, a few weeks ago, Mark Butcher sat down for 45 minutes or so with his old mate Rob Key to talk about a whirlwind year for the England men's team. A year ago, Rob and Mark were colleagues in the commentary box at Sky and now 12 months on, Key has overseen a dramatic transformation in the fortunes of the England men's team, a time that's seen them win 10 tests out of 11 and a T20 World Cup. Here is that chat between Mark and Rob. Rob, time was uh, you and I would spend an enormous amount of time together, either on the road or, God forbid, on the golf course or whatever. I haven't seen you for, for months. Um, the change in, in your life and the change in uh, the way that you spend your time has been has been quite extraordinary. Is, is the job everything you thought it would be? And, and how has it changed things for you on a, on a day-to-day basis? Do you know what? When I, when I took the job, I didn't really know what I thought it would be. I had no idea, as people probably wrote and said, about what being an administrator, which sort of makes me shudder, I never thought I'd be one of those, actually is, which I suppose I am. Um, so I sort of got on the train the first day around Easter time to come into Lords to meet Tom Harrison and didn't have a clue about anything. All I knew was I wanted, you know, I knew what I wanted to do which was sort of changed the mentality and the way of which we went about playing cricket. Apart from that, I had no idea, but I had, a, I had a view that in life, there's a lot, if you ask for help, there's a lot of people who will give it to you. And I thought, surely for all these other things, you know, there'll be someone there to help me. And in our department, there's so many good people. In the ECB, there's so many good people that have sort of covered all my weaknesses along the way. <laughs> what much maligned um, organisation, but to, to hear... To hear you say that, I mean, you and I have both been on the outside of the ECB for a long time. The only time we ever turned up in this building is when we were getting fined for something. <laughs> um, it, that's, I mean, that's that's something that people don't often hear about the ECB. Everyone likes to give them a bit of stick. Well, and and I remember, you know, and that's right. There, there has there's been a lot of negative press about what goes on in this building at times, or, or what's happened. A lot of that down to probably the hundred and things like that, and county cricket. And there's a lot of contentious issues. But the one thing I do know, nearly every single person here, in fact, every single person is a fan of cricket and wants to try and grow the game, to try and expand the game, to take it into new audiences, to make more people play it, to engage with people, to to do everything they possibly can to just make cricket the best sport it possibly is from lots of different reasons, not just from how we play it. And there's so many good people here and uh, it's it's been a joy really and they have helped me out probably from day one and will continue. I mean, there's times when I sort of say, how on earth do I work this Outlook thing? Can someone tell me how I send this, you know, this, this email? What's good? You know, and I have no, and yet there'll be someone here, someone in HIM or Adler, someone like that who will just sort of hold my hand all the way through and, and make my life much easier really and it's been it's it's been good fun. Um, a lot of us uh, knowing knowing what we do and how our life is as commentators working the television, we're kind of you know a little bit shocked that you that you gave that up <laughs> yeah. um, to dive into to a job which at the time, um, you know, England's Test team were were having a shocking time of it. The, the game had all these contentious issues as you as you mentioned, um, and to and to jump out of what is pretty cushy gig to go into into the frying pan or out of the frying pan into the fire um it seemed like a, a bizarre choice what, what what grabbed you about it why did you feel that you had to throw your hand into the ring to do this yeah so i was doing a vodcast after the ashes with nasa and ath and we're you know, doing what we do you know it's like on tv and in the media you sort of i call it back trade on everything you we spend our time you know if england doing well we say they're going well and if they're going bad you effectively say why they're not going so well and I remember sort of doing that vodcast and I think, do you know what, I, I could have a go at that. And they're talking about the various roles and I thought, you know, I want to, and I never really ever thought that that would happen. And the one thing that, you know, is, oh, I love that job for Sky. It, it's the best job going really in terms of you sitting around with great people and NASA and you're able to <laughs> sort of, you know, you're talking about what you love all the time. Yeah. But the one thing that you've not really got a skin in the game, skin in the game. You're not really, you know, I could come up with as many mad ideas as, as I wanted to really on TV. Eventually everyone will sort of tweet you into oblivion, but it doesn't really matter. And you, everyone forgets what you said three weeks ago. And then you just go, you, you trade a different position. Mm. Whereas I thought 
this was going to be more meaningful. I, I'd wake up in however many years, however it went, I'd wake up and think, you know, what an experience that was. And, and you'd find out if all your theories, all your philosophies had any backing, if they were right in any way, um, which is the one thing that really appealed to me. You know, NASA yourself, you played 70 odd tests, Ath, all of these people, you know, they, NASA's done his time of helping out English cricket mm. and trying to make a difference. I didn't feel that I had. Um, so I suppose that was the itch I wanted to scratch. <laughs> um, speaking of bold, uh, you come into the job with uh, with virtually nobody left. You know, everyone's jumped <laughs> off the the ship or been or been pushed off it or made to walk the plank. Um, uh, and the the first thing is you've got to find you've got to find coaches. You've got to find people to actually look after teams that are <laughs> that are about to go off on on tours or, or cricketing assignments. Um, the uh, the interview. Or the thought for for Baz McCullum in the first place, and then the interview has become sort of stuff of, of legend. <laughs> um, talk to us first of all about your about your thinking around inviting him, and then give us a bit of a clue as to what happened behind that closed door. Well, uh, so you know, first of all, I don't th you know I I wouldn't have been interested in the job if it was flying if England were doing really really well, because there's no scope for change really when things are going as they were and people have been sacked and all that as daunting as that might sound you actually think you know people are going to be bold enough to back you and to to see change or to see a different way of going so that was the first thing um and then i was very clear as i said you know to me there's sort of two types of people there's two types of ways of doing things there's the people that see the trouble everywhere all they focus on is the danger all they focus on is the problems you know, it's the sort of people that you say, you know, should we go down the road and have a drink? And they say, yeah, but the traffic's bad. <laughs> you know, or whatever you do, they've always got, it's like, do you know what? You've got a problem for every solution. And it drives me mad. And then you have the people who see the optimism in life, who see that, you know, and I think your brain just works better that way. If you want your brain to be more active and work quicker and allow you to move better, think positively, think positive thoughts in a way. I sound like a you know, one of these self-help people. Well, no, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of coaching in that as well, isn't there? I know that would be your mantra if you were talking to, to somebody, talking to a young kid about batting. It, it sounds like almost exactly the same thing. The more positive your outlook, the, the better the results are going to be because you will move more definitely, be more, uh, you know, be, be more sort of sharp in, in your thinking and in the way that you, that you move. Yeah, your decision making is better. Mm. Your brain just works better that way. And, you know, we played in a time where and i could never understand it so so you would play international cricket and everyone would say and in the academies and coming up and they do it at times in in age group coaching where you go do you know what you want to be a professional cricketer or you want to play for england a lot of pressure in that gig so we're going to ramp up the pressure now and make it so tough and so unenjoyable but at least you'll know how to deal with it and when you get there you're like you just can't you, you know you can't do anything it's like try and catch a ball if you're so tense, you know, tense up your whole body and think, I better not drop this, you know, my life depends on it. See how hard that ball is to catch. Mm. And then just do the opposite and try and relax and think, no, what does it matter really if this doesn't work? And then you find life so much easier. And also I feel, and this is what Stokes, McCullum, Mott and Joss get so well, is that actually it's not the end of the world if you lose. It's mm. not the end of the world if you fail. So when you declare in Pakistan, and you give them, after dominating the game, and you give them a 50-50 bet, maybe even a 60-40 in their favour, do you know if you lose that? It's not the end of the world. You still, you know, everyone will have a go at you, and then a couple of days later, you'll get up and you'll start for the next game, and that will be forgotten, and you move on. So it's sort of trying to trick your mind that it's, you know, we all know it's important, but you're trying to take some of that off the players. Mm. Um, so Brendan then, when, when you invited him in, I mean, you're a pretty laid back, laid back guy, anyway. Uh, and Baz is, you know, he, there's no pressure in that man's life ever. You see him sat on the balcony, and it's, you almost imagine people fanning him with with great big ferns and feeding him grapes up there. He's just kind of, you know, so laid back. How how was that interview? You know, of course, you you've not done aside from interviewing like this, you know, on the on the TV. That that's a that's for a big job. That's an important. Um, important little passage of play for you to be able to get it right when you speak to the guy. How was it? Well, but that, there's two things on there. One is when I did the interview, I thought, well, I've actually sat around being interviewed by NASA. Uh, we sat around, you know, and, you, and you're arguing with all of you guys all the time, Wardy, 
So I'd actually spent my life being interviewed. So that's the first thing. And then the other side, like what you're doing now, this is what a job interview is almost, mm -hmm. where you're trying to find out what a person's about. You're trying to find the absolute key, I think, is you're trying to find alignment in a basic philosophy. Not agreement, but just, you know, do you, do you have the same inner sort of beliefs as me who's in charge of this thing at the moment and that's what I saw in Brendan so you know and, and with people like that you have to convince them that you're going to stay the course and that you're up for the ride as well mm. you know because he's very clear on what he wants to do and how he wants to do it and I remember and he's an inspiring sort of bloke he, he, he sort of sat on a zoom call and we constantly I must have interviewed him five or six times with various different people and Strauss he was a massive part in all of this he doesn't get any credit I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Strauss he, no, nor with Brendan um, and we just sort of going backwards and forwards. And every time he'd say something, you know, like, and he'd do it, I won't do his accent, but he's so laid back and he'd sort of say, you know, I, you know, I just think it's for us to try and really help test cricket because, you know, no one else is really going to do it. So why don't we do it? And I thought, yeah, that's not bad. Because <laughs> yeah, I always think you need that bigger cause. It can't be, it's never about winning or losing. It's about a way of playing. It's about a mentality. It's about enjoyment. And he had that. And I remember every single time and every different person that came into that interview process to interview him, because you can't just hire that person. Everyone thinks that we just played golf and then he came in. Not <laughs> at all. He went through a lot of interviews with lots of different people. And the last one was with four, probably five of us. And every single time we all just came away inspired by what he was saying. And then we just thought, oh, how good is that going to be for for the players to be able to do it. And he was perfect, I thought, because he had the right mentality, the right attitude, and he was going to relax players. He had the credibility as well. Mm. So when you've got the senior players there have done so much in the game, you know, he could he he got them within a few seconds. And to me, he'd done what we needed to do before. So when everyone said, Oh, he's never coached a Red Bull game, he's never done this, I'm just what are you talking about he's done this for New Zealand and done it really, really well. Mm. In fact, he's helped England by how good he was as a captain for New Zealand. So what's all the fuss about? For every prime candidate, there are, there are others who would have applied. I mean, what, what was that process like? For uh, did, did you did you see people that had terrific CVs or whatever, but actually didn't have that that similar vision, that, that sort of alignment in terms of in terms of the bigger picture? And, and was that the reason why people with more experience, perhaps? Uh, name names because I'm not entirely sure who went myself I thought I'd let you tell me um you know in comparison to to Brendan who as I say had no no coaching experience you know what what was that what was the difference there uh you you could ju just the way that it, just on that we were very much of the same opinion and he's you know much better than I am and that was it. And everyone else for to different degrees. Some had that, some were completely the opposite. And you know everyone in cricket, or there's someone that knows everyone in cricket. And there's people, you have a huge application process. Then you have the odd person that you target as well and want to find out if they're interested, especially at that level. There's blind CVs, all kinds of stuff that, that you go through with it. And as I say, all you're looking for is that alignment. I'm not going to name names of people who went for it. You know, but sometimes what I would say is that when it comes to experience, I think that can be a positive and a negative because a lot of the time people go, they've got a lot of experience. So then you think, yeah, all right. Everyone you speak to about that person says, yeah, they're right. You know, what was so-and-so like? Yeah, not bad. And you think, well, that's not what we want. <laughs> so your experience actually in jobs can be to the detriment of you because unless you, what you want is someone to go, what's that person like? And you want to, you want to be able to say, unbelievable. You know, and if so, it, it's bittersweet at times experience. Um, and that was the process, just lots of sort of effectively doing podcasts after podcasts with various <laughs> coaches. And so it was very much in my wheelhouse. Um, and then, of course, Ben Stokes comes along to, to complete the, the triangle. Um, I guess looking at it from the position that, that English cricket or at least the test team found itself in after the, the West Indies tour, there probably wasn't many other choices. <laughs> But Ben, but I suppose the question was always, um, you know, is is him being England's perhaps best player all around all these other types of totemic things that that he is, was that enough? And if you had the captaincy, was that going to be 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 something that was going to drag him down? So, the, were you always absolutely one hundred percent set on Ben, or was there a, was there again the similar sort of process where you had to kind of speak and and figure out the way that he was thinking and the way that you were thinking? No, I, I was set on Ben 
from the start actually from a little way back because he again embodied what I thought the team needed and he was the one more so than anyone that would be able to go with that because we started very well but actually what I felt you needed was someone who had the courage if it didn't go well in the first game which is what Brendan has and which Stokes he has in abundance <laughs> you know you talk about alignment he's to another level I mean the, the bloke just really saw he both of those you, you can't change a culture by one sort of hour-long webinar that people put you on or some sort of education piece where someone's talking at you for an hour and a half and say, there you go, culture sorted. You've got to live these every second of the day, which they do. Mm. You know, and and it, so, so Ben had that. I felt he was the only one that could really sort of drive what we wanted to do forward. Um, and he was clearly going to have his own views, which he does, and he's taken it to a level that I never thought that he would be able to or anyone would be able to. Um, and that was a key. And the other thing that he has, which I think is massive in leadership, he's incredibly smart, but he's got so much empathy. So he's not going to be one of these great players who can't understand. I want a great player. Say, well, why can't you do what I'm doing? It's like, why don't you just go and play like I'm doing? I go, yeah, all right, because you're the best player who's ever lived, you know, or whatever, or Murley. It's like, well, not that Murley was like this. It's like, yeah, you just bowl a few off and you do a deuce rare and that's it. Why can't people do that? Well, he doesn't think that really. He's, he's the same. He's got a lot of empathy. So I thought that Stokes had those qualities and that alignment. I didn't get the people saying, yeah, but you need two leaders who are completely different. Mm. All I see there is an argument. Just friction, yeah. 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 You know, and it's like, to me, in my head, whenever I captain, if I had a coach that was aligned to me and we had that, it was a dream to work together. If you didn't have that, it's a nightmare because you just think, don't say that, don't say that because you say the wrong thing. You put a negative spin on something, then a player listens to that. It's like saying, you know, coaches that say, right, let's play without fear here, but let's not lose more than two wickets. In the <laughs> yeah. And you're like, go at 12s, but don't get yeah, caught along off. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's only run a ball. Don't yeah. take any risks. Just <laughs> run a ball. Don't take a risk. And so everyone goes out there going, oh, and it's like three and over. And then before you know it, it's tens. And then you take a risk and you get home. So that's why, you know, it just made sense to me with Ben um, and he's been outstanding. I had to think about this this morning. Um, was, was sort of comparing him and, and, and Ian both. I mean, obviously Ben a little bit older, a bit, a bit more experienced when he t got the captaincy mm -hmm. than, than Beefy was, the other, the other sort of um, one of England's great all-rounders. Uh, and it, it, that was exactly the thought that occurred to me, was that um, Beefy's way of leading was to, was to kind of do it. And do yeah. it amazingly and then kind of go to everybody else. Well, there you go. <laughs> you know, right. that was you know, very much sort of his. And you, and you kind of feel that from him when you, when you meet him. It's kind of inspiring, but it's also quite daunting, you know, yeah. to have somebody have that expect. Why can't you be as good as me? <laughs> um, and, and you're right. And that, exactly the thought that came to my head was that Ben, not only is he able to kind of go out there and, 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 and walk the walk, but he kind of he has a way of being able to, to allow people to kind of come along with him, which is a which is incredible leadership. As you say, most people with that sort of skill level and that, that sort of um, aura around them find it very difficult to, to lower themselves to, to lift everybody else up. But that's what you see every day when you watch them out on the field. And, and that's exactly right. And that, to me, it, that is where it's not the sort of how you tell someone to play a cover drive or how you teach them their technique, how you take pressure off, all that stuff, how you get them to maximise their potential, which is your job, right? If you're a coach, you want your player and a leader, you want your players, if their potential is sort of up here, you're doing your job well if they're all maximising that, if they're all reaching that, and then going further. And it's the little moments with them. I don't go in the dressing room that often, but they're both so clever. They both sort of know when someone gets a 20 and someone, you know, Joe Root's got a brilliant hundred that that's the person to make a big deal of. You know what? A lot of coaches, what we do, we used to have it at Kent once where they say, let's set, let's let's toast the bloke who's who's done well. I say, all right. And then so at the end of a game, I remember once, I think I'd got hundred actually, and I'd run out Sam Northeast on a flat one who'd got five and missed out and was probably thinking, you know, the world's coming to an end here. And then they make him get up and sort of toast me and say, well done, Keezy, and all of this. I'm thinking this must be, a, and I'm looking at him laughing, <laughs> thinking, how bad is this? Because the person who needs building up the per is the one who's not done very well. Mm. The bloke who's got 100, you don't worry about him. He's got 100, he's He'll fine. He'll be fine, yeah. You know, and they know those moments. They know that it's a quiet word to the person sitting in the corner quietly. They know that it's, you know, just, you know, when the bowlers have had a tough day, 
that actually that's a time to be positive, you know, and they get that as well as anyone. Positivity, I, I suppose, <laughs> ep epitomised by by the win in Islamabad, which <clears throat> probably a bit of recency bias involved from my point of view, but I, I still think that's the best test win I've ever seen. Yeah. Forget forget that Pakistan might not have been at full strength or whatever, but to to force a win in that way, in those circumstances, on that deck in Pakistan, I thought was astonishing. I mean. If you had a if you had a, a dream, Martin Luther King style, but when you <laughs> when you took us took over, you know you might as well quit now. You get the get get the well, thing, spark up the action. cigar, spark up the cigars, and 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 leave it because that was that embodied everything that you that you've spoken about. Yeah, I often think the time to quit was after New Zealand, then when we beat <laughs> India, and then I keep thinking, you know, go now, Keezy, this is it. But um, yeah, and the amazing thing like that was Stokes and McCullum. I can't tell you which one was more, but that they both the way they do things is exceptional and they both have such a good understanding of mentality and you know the the way you you, you get the best out of people brendan often sort of predicts what's going to happen he doesn't know he's doing it but he says, oh, i reckon this will happen and you like you think back a couple of weeks later and think yeah, he was right there um but the, the the thing about that was that they they concentrate more on the style the way they want people to play than the plan so the plan evolves throughout the game. So it's not like, right, okay, we're going to get 500 today and then we're going to do this and then we're going to do that and then we'll set them a, a sporting declaration. It's like, just go out there, play to your full potential. We then pick the players that can deliver on that, you know, whether it's a Crawley, a, you know, a Ben Duckett, Ollie Pope, all of that. And then you're on a flat pitch, which that was. And I think... We saw, look, I was there then, I think, and I'd been there for Australia, Pakistan, and I knew that was a flat pitch. But there's no like, this is how we're going to win the game. They never look too far ahead. It's just like, right, go and play. And then it just goes and goes and goes. And there's no slogging, I don't think, in mm. that. You know, Stokesy will run down and try and, you know, get the fastest. I reckon, he, I reckon he's the only one who actually has a slog, you know. <laughs> well, <caps>. yeah. <laughs> he, but, you know, in his eyes, he doesn't see the... the the, the fear that we see you know i'm thinking oh, i'll run down i might get you know i might get out here he, he just thinks he's going to smack it 10 rows back and he just and everyone else is sort of just he makes them all justified in what they do by what he's doing because he's prepared to take it to the limit so i love seeing what he's doing um but it just evolved into that and then they've got courage because they know that actually somewhere along the line, you know, if we, if they've got us to a point because they talk about entertainment, which is what we're meant to be in. That's the business we're in entertaining that they know what's the alternative. What well, we just have a very, very boring game. Mm. So somehow they've worked out that we're in the right to sort of potentially lose this game and we'll get more credit than we would do if we just had the most boring test match of all time. And I think, you know, somewhere along the lines, losing has just become far too big a deal. And mm. it's the same with anything, any failure in this, in any country at the moment, you know, everything just gets whacked, you know, social media, everyone makes such a big deal of it. So there's a lot of fear out there. Whereas those two have sort of worked out that, oh, well, we'll just keep, we'll have another go the next day. Basball. Yeah. I know that, that Brendan hates it and the, and the team perhaps feel it's a little bit disrespectful for what they do, but there, there aren't, there are not many organisations or sort of coaching teams that have, have had a, a phrase coined or a word <laughs> coined for the way they go about it. I mean, it's kind of it's it's kind of complimentary, isn't it? What what do you think? Yeah, I, I think the point is that it, one, it, there's a lot more to it than that, and I think Brendan in particular sort of thinks, well, it's not my it's not my ball, you know. We're calling it after <laughs> him. There's a lot, you know, Stokes here, as he said, you know, Ben Stokes has a massive part of it, so it just doesn't it just do, doesn't trip off the tongue it, as well. Exactly, Stokes ball or whatever, and but. You know, and, and there's a real danger, I think, at times. This is when we met with the directors of cricket. Yeah, you know, because none of this would happen if we didn't have the players coming through. You know, we've got this huge talent pool that is coming through in our game, which is extraordinary. You know, Harry Brook hasn't been made because of Stokes and McCallum. He's come through a whole system from probably, I don't know, under threes or something, whatever it is. And that's why he's there. So there's a huge amount of work that's come in. And I think it's like a little bit, we're a bit wary of sounding like we're preaching because there'll be bad days in this. This is just the way we think and those two in particular think things should be done. Doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean it's the only way to go and someone will evolve it and someone will come up with a new way and someone will find a way to stop it in the future, I'm sure. 
it's just the way we think that we like to do things. And people can take it or leave it, to be honest. I don't care if county players take it on or don't. That's for them to decide. It's not for us to tell them what they've got to do. Selection. I mean, you mentioned it just now. You mentioned Harry Brook, Ryan Ahmed, um, youngest ever <clears throat> test player for England, um, doing his thing in, in great style in, in Pakistan. Uh, ben Duckett opening the batting for England. All, all of these sort of choices that are being made. And you you now, one of your many hats in, in, the, in the job, is you're, you're kind of on the selection panel. Was that always... Um, always something that you imagined that you would be doing or had you imagined that that would be palmed off onto somebody else and you just kind of ended up being stuck with it? No, like like the cricket really, it just evolved. So when I came in, there was no selector. It was Chris Silverwood that was doing everything sort of famously what had happened back then. You know, and we ended up changing it to having two, a coach for each, well, for the, the white ball and the red ball, um, two separate captains, which they'd always had. And then the plan was that we're going to need a head selector. Um, and I stood in in the interim. And basically how it works is you would have, I would decide on who gets priority. So in the simplest of terms, and I made it very clear to the coaches this, test cricket gets the priority until the World Cup comes around. So for instance, you know, people are talking now about the ODIs. Joss and Motti, in, I don't think I've had a bilateral series where they've had precedent over the test team so if there's test cricket going on where it's overlapping pretty much at the moment test team gets the player so joe root is out at the test team and vice versa so they have had to do and that doesn't bother me because i see you know duckett brook all these guys playing in pakistan in the t20 series you did that's a good thing mm. you know as long as we peak at the right time and i'm excited by our 50 over cricket i think i watched ollie stone bowl the other day i saw brook get his first 50 and then you think about the players coming back and it's like, wow, this is going to be pretty mm. special. Um, so the selection now, the, 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 you have myself, the captain and coach are both formats that do it. And so then when I was, we were looking for a selector, it started evolving because I suddenly worked out that I said, you know what, while we're all sort of, you know, while the white ball, the World Cup's going on, Baz is in New Zealand or he's just thinking about test cricket all the time which was never the case for Chris Silwood. He was sort of in one series and then it's right very quickly. He's got to now think of the next one. And it's very hard to do. Whereas now you have the coaches, the captains, who can sort of spend a lot of their time when they're not playing, thinking about selection. So my job is to facilitate that and add to it. And we have this huge scouting network, which couldn't have had, this couldn't have worked with Strauss when he was doing it, this job managing director, because that wasn't in place. So now you have this huge information source coming and it's our job, the coach and the captains, to sort of decide on which the best way to go is. And because we've got a clear style and brand, it becomes an easier thing to do. And so Luke Wright will come into that as well and he'll be able to go on some of the trips that I don't do and he'll be able to add to that process. He'll be able to watch Lions cricket, county cricket. So he will add a hell of a lot to that as well. But the system will sort of stay relatively similar. Um... Because, you know, it, it, people always want, everyone, I was like in the media, said, well, we want to know who's accountable for selection. We, you don't often know because one day the captain might get his way. One day the coach might get his way. One day I might get my way. One day the scouts, you know, whoever will tip someone up. It's for me to know who's accountable, really. And that's overrated. It's about getting the decision right. I suppose when... Uh when the proof in the pudding or out on the field is good, then it, then it kind of doesn't matter. The, uh, the the questions go away. Um, there's Just quite one a bit thing of, on that. Yeah, that that and that's absolutely right. The real focus for us is making sure players maximise their potential, hmm. not just thinking, well, he's not played well. Okay, we'll get rid of him and we'll bring someone else in. It's like, no, no. Why is he not playing to his best? What can we do to help the person we thought was the best selection in the first place? What, you know, if his best isn't good enough, then we'll move on. Hmm. But if his best is good enough, then that's fine. Yeah, and is that back trading again, isn't it? Because, uh, I mean, selectors have done it since the dawn of time where you kind of, they make a big splash about picking some guy who's, who's done extremely well and then three games later <laughs> drop him. Well, whose fault is that? It's not the players, it's the selectors, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I get you. Um, good stuff. The, uh, I suppose the next thing is, I mean, you mentioned it just now in, in, in terms of selection. You just, you've got all these interweaving parts at the moment. So you've got, what, 60, 70 English players playing in, in T20 leagues or in white ball mm. cricket around the, the world, which is terrific. You've got these guys picking up um, great experience around the place. 
You've got three test, uh, three One Day Internationals going on in, in South Africa. You've got a test series just about, I mean, two tests in New Zealand. That, that'll be your next job. You've got to sort out the schedule because that's an absolute <laughs> disgrace. Go all that way for two <laughs> test matches. And then right off the back of that, or literally as as that the test matches are running, there, there are the matches in, in Bangladesh. That's got to be a, an absolute nightmare for you guys. Yeah, and that's where the white ball team, you know, Joss and, and Motti really bear the brunt of that, really, because they don't get the... You know, the, the, their their strongest side, in essence, if the test players are not there. So they're missing out on Joe Root, for example, now, as I said earlier. So, yeah, it's fiddly at the moment. There's no doubt about that. So you're constantly trying, OK, and then the South Africa one, it's like, right, all these players, some are in the UAE, some are there. When can we go? We've got a couple of practice games on. I will cancel the practice games and then they can just go, you know, they can have competitive cricket going into that. So Joffre, when his plan was to play two, now we've cancelled the practice games. He can now play five, and it's like here we go, and and so it's it's constant. It's, it's not that big a deal because people with worse jobs don't get me wrong, and it does ease up a little bit. The the real problem with the schedule, I think, is not necessarily the amount of cricket. It's it's how close it is. So when you look back to last summer. The white ball guys played, what, 12 games or something? I think it was, I can't even remember. Whatever it was last year, they played South Africa and India in a bilateral series. Forget about the World Cup. And, well, and they also had the, the matches in, in Amsterdam, didn't they, in June? Amsterdam. So that there, was a, there was probably, I don't know, 15 or so, maybe 15 white ball games, like one after the other. Yeah, and the same thing. And then the test series, it's not exactly, you know, they play, you know, five, six tests a year, or a summer, whatever it is. It's the problem that the white ball games come in 20 days. Mm. So it's like nothing for a period. And then it's like game, day off, play, game, travel, play, game, travel, play. That's where it's really tough. You know, if, you, if you're able to spread it out somehow, but it's a nightmare for whoever's doing the schedules because you've got all these different factors, broadcast deals, all of that stuff, and now you've got franchise cricket, everything in there. So the, the windows are getting smaller and smaller, but we're doing the same amount of cricket where everyone's just getting squashed in. So you can't then play game after game. At the moment, we can't physically get, you know, our strongest team to every single game England play. And then the other thing that's coming and is here now really is the cost, the, the difference in what they get paid for England compared to what they get getting offered around the world. You know, you're talking mm. five, $600,000 for a few weeks work. So, in so some you, cases. you've got to try and navigate the, the idea that the players are actually going to turn down in England, either England tours or England contracts oh. at, at, at some point or another because financially it doesn't work. For them. Yeah, and maybe not so much the England contracts, but certainly, you know, if you're not on a central contract, yeah. Yeah. then the, the difference is huge. And there, I don't know a person in the world that would actually sit there and go, do you know what? I'm not bothered about that amount of money. You're talking about life changing amounts of money, and you know. So, so these are the these are the next things we're, we're having to negotiate. This is what the game has to try and work out mm. what it's going to do. Um, and I don't at the moment know the answer. And but that's the sort of thing that these these things have happened almost overnight. I know Ath would say, you know, he saw it in the IPL coming, which is true. Yeah, this was always coming. But it wasn't until these two league, leagues in South Africa and the UAE where the money just went, boom, went up, that it's now started to be really competitive. And look, we're lucky. We've got our summer doesn't, you know, it doesn't run alongside these things. If you're in Australia and you're going to end up, your, your domestic players are going to get taken to these leagues that are running at the same time. You know, and the game's got to, got to, the global game, the international game has to have a serious think and get together about what it's going to do to make sure that there's meaning in the cricket that we play. That's the key. It's not just about money. It's about we need the meaning to be there to make people want to play. County cricket, I mean, it's, it's going to be part of your remit, even if it's not directly part of your remit, because that's where where your players come from. You just mentioned Harry Brook and his development and, and Yorkshire's part in that. Um, the county members are, are unlikely to be happy with whatever happens, but you can, you can understand <laughs> at the moment, can't you? It, it, it feels like a mess. And yet 
um, as you've said before, the, the players being produced by this system that, that everyone says is terrible are, uh, are, are very, very good. So the two things can't be true at the same time. No, and, and I think, again, county cricket a little bit reflects international cricket where, again, it's not necessarily always the amount that they play. It's how close it is together. I can't remember what it is at the start of the summer. All the championship cricket is going to be whack. Here we go. Well, not all of it nearly half of it's going to be played in the first couple of months. And it's a nightmare to get right that schedule because, again, you've got so many competing interests. You've got the Blast, you've got the 100, you've got international career, all of these things. And it's so hard. And, and my point, my starting point, is always like what's best for the players, really, to be able to maximise their potential for fast bowlers, opening batsmen, spinners in particular. You know, And, uh, and I completely get that that's not the starting point for a county necessarily, for a county chair, for the members, for all of these people. And it's so hard to keep everyone happy. Um, but there's no doubt that talent is coming in abundance, really. And that's through, you know, pathway cricket. But there's things we've got to do right there. That's got to be as accessible and affordable for everyone as you can. That's only going to help. And these are where the players are coming from as well. You know, so look, there's a lot that English cricket's doing right. And when you lose an Ashes, it all gets, you know, hammered. And there's a lot that could be better as well. Um, it's just, as we found out last year with the review and stuff like that, that it's it's not an easy thing to get to get right. And it's mm. not an easy thing to get through either. I mean, do, do, we, do we pay... I mean, again, it's easy for us. Our, our careers are done and we, we kind of... I played with, with 18 first-class counties all in the one league and then it yeah. got split to two and there was a, a definite feeling in the dressing rooms around the country that the two divisions made things better. Yeah. And you could point to the fact that, um, you know, by the time we got to the, the end of the, the first decade of this millennium, England being the best side in the world, that it kind of had borne some fruit. There were there were some terrific players out there, some some good teams. Um. Obviously now you sort of you know, hundreds come in, so that's taken a chunk of time out of, of a very short summer anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there are talk about having three three divisions. Do we get too caught up in the, the sort of like the, the, the this divisional side of things? Is there an optimal way of doing it? Was two divisions fine, and we should and should never should never have been touched? You know what? How do you see it? I mean, you're you're a guy who likes solutions rather than pointing out yeah, what yeah. the problems are. How how would you go if you had if you had the chance? Uh, and maybe this could be your next job. <laughs> Take a couple of months off to go and, <laughs> and play a bit of golf and then this can be your next gig. If you had the chance, how would you arrange it? Well, as you say, I think we've added a month into the season with the 100. A month that wasn't there. Yeah, exactly. So, so then you've got to find space. So for me, as we said, I, I would end up playing less four-day cricket because that's the biggest chunk of the summer. And I know everyone will now start nailing me for that and, and i'll just to me you know the, the county game financially like the rest of the country is not in the world's greatest shape and i've always seen the hundred as the way to sustain that that's always well i've never quite got the you know and you look at the hundred you know you had something that was there for that was worth nothing that's now worth a lot more now in the future that might be worth more it might be worth less i don't know that's for people above me to decide so the game that i love the county game kent all these things that i'm a product of i see that as a way to really sustain all of that to keep it going because you need all these counties around bring it being hubs for players to come through for giving someone to have a love for the game you know and and so that would be how i would do it i also think you need to have the best standard you possibly could because that's what I remember Australian cricket having in that great era in the 90s and 2000s that you played against probably too much you know and so you, the more you can have the best players playing against each other the better um, so that was where I where I always got to or where I thought and I understood exactly you know people well you're taking a, two championship games away from a home venue I understood that that was the trade off but you know I want to see Ken and not just Ken, because obviously from there, all these counties, they're in, in 20 years' time, I want, you know, people, my kids' kids, to be able to go and watch cricket at these places. And that was a way to move with the times because the model has just changed overnight with all this cricket that's going around. Um, but I completely accept and understand that, you know, that's my opinion and there's not a lot of people or there's not many people in the county game in terms of the supporters that, that want to see that, which is fine. Crystal ball gazing again, I guess. Um, <laughs> test match game in five, ten years' time. I mean, presumably, 
your 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 job with England may well have come to an end by then. You might know. You might you might get oh, the five, get the yes. get the get the taste for being an administrator. You know, get get a <laughs> wardrobe full of blazers and and decide that that's the way you're going to go. Um, but you know, you've you've started down a road with England, um, uh, and and the the rest of the world is looking at it, and some of them are saying no, that's that's not for us, and others are kind of going, well, it looks like quite a lot of fun. How do you how do you see the the test game going? Because ultimately your goal with it all is to is to get is to get people to love watching and playing test match cricket and to keep it relevant so how do you how do you see that developing over the next 5 years or so um i honestly don't know i sort of, i i sort of look at it and think you know i look around i think in england it's so important it's so it, you come to Lords, you come to anywhere, you have sellout grounds in Test cricket. You, we've got the Ashes this year. You get India, Sri Lanka, all these countries coming and it's well supported. My concern is that's not the case everywhere else. You know, you, you end up and, you know, it's all well and good for us having all of these plans and we have the resources to do it because Test cricket is a hard slog to prepare players for. All that stuff I'm talking about with Brooke and Root and all these players that have come through the system. There's a lot of investment. There's a lot of infrastructure that's needed in that and we have the resources and the will to do it. And my concern is as the global game changes is that we need someone to play against. You know, so it might be right, Australia, India, you know, if they've still got the will to do it, that's a good thing. And my concern is that other nations will just sit there and say, do you know what, this is, this is, there's too much money with not enough return. You know, and actually everyone's after T20 cricket, which I love watching T20, but there can be too much of it. Mm. And that's where I think the game has to try and get together and come up with some solutions, which I don't know the answers to. Mm. Ricky Ponting was saying the other day about what, the ICC can do all that. I don't know what's right or wrong. I, I wonder if I wonder if the you know again it, it might come down to it, it probably should come down to England, Australia, India, the, the the teams that have the resources. I think if if we in this country and and, and they in theirs are, are serious about about Test match cricket, then it's going to have to come from them. I think the the ICC and I don't want to talk out of turn here, but I'm going to. Um, it, it have, have for a very long time sat on their hands over this issue, mm. which has been, you know, a slow moving car crash for the last, you know, 15, 20 years with West Indies and Sri Lanka finding it difficult, New Zealand basically losing players to, to franchise cricket, even when they're contracted, all of these things. And it's just been obvious that if you don't, if you can't, if you don't have the resources to play and keep players playing the format, they will go and do something else. Mm -hmm. So maybe it will come down to the likes of yourself. Maybe it will come down to English cricket. You know the home, the home of the whole thing. To actually say, well, okay, put the money where their mouth is, as you've done in this mm. job, and kind of do something about it ourselves. Is that something you can see? Is there an appetite for that here? Well, I think that all you can do, as I say, is, is concentrate really on what you think you can control at that point. And all we can do is try and make this as entertaining as it possibly can be, and hope that everyone else. What happens? You know, we're talking about you know things like governance and all that that i have no real clue about mm. but all we could if we can do it and then that can be infectious and other people can then take <laughs> it hasn't stopped you with doing this bit you know you've, <laughs> you've, been, you've been very very successful having admitted you had no clue about it yeah. that's what i mean you know that you talked about experience and and, yeah. and and having experience can be a negative because there's lots of no's when you have lots well, of experience uh, yeah and, and the problem is a lot of the time if you play if you've come through a certain structure and the rules within that structure, it becomes very hard for people within it to play outside the rules of it and to actually see a different side of things. So I accept all of that. But it's such a complicated thing. But somewhere along the line, I think what it's really going to take is just a coming together of the most important players in the game, India, Australia, England, ICC, all of these, and making sure that... And, and actually, if we want to, because you said there, now the car crash that's been coming... What's coming is actually going to make cricket one of the most popular games in the world, if not the most popular. Obviously, football's right up there. But everything's going to be more money in it for players. It's such an exciting time. The problem is it just might not be as we always remember. It, it won't be in the five-day format. It'll be in well, a, a squeezed no, format. No, I, I always think Test cricket will be there. Mm. I always think that because I think there's enough history and there's enough meaning. It's a bit like the Ryder Cup, stuff like that. And it's special enough, and certainly for England. So, but you're right. It's what do we do? You know, South Africa, um, these teams that we grew up watching, the West Indies. I mean, mm. 
nearly all of my heroes are the West Indian cricketers, you know, Brian Lara, people like that, Desmond Haynes, all these players, they're the ones, you know, it wasn't sort of like Mark Butcher with this sort of wavy <laughs> bat lift, you know. It was these guys that used to watch, you know, was it like, was it Philo Wallace and Clayton Lambert? Clayton Lambert, Clayton yeah, yeah. Lambert yeah. smashing Dean Headley everywhere. It's like, <laughs> how good is this? And the yeah. new boys would come out and be like, right, great. <laughs> yeah, I'll watch these boys back again, you know. Uh, anyway, but... <laughs> Yeah, so I don't. I'm sort of waffling. It, it, it's a, it's just you know, like all these things, you need the the smartest people in the room to get together and come up with a solution. Okay, let's squeeze it down to to this summer then before I before <laughs> I let you go. Um, things, as you said, could not have gone any better. England hold both white ball trophies at the moment. The, the preparation for the World Cup has, has hit a bit of a bump in the road, but as you said, there's the availability of the, of the best team mm. has not been has not been there. So I'm sure it will be all right on the night there. Um, and and you've got an Ashes coming up. I mean, you, you mentioned that the Ashes was the thing that kind of th that started the the doom spiral and actually got you into the gig. Yeah, um, could be the thing that could be. It could be. <laughs> it could well be. But it it could also be sort of you know that the, the sort of the the absolute justification of everything that you've managed to turn around right. with Brendan, with Ben, um, with with ECB support and whatever um into into something really really glorious i mean how exciting is that for you and 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 could you could you have imagined yourself being in a position right now where you are you're actually unbelievably confident going into a home ashes series when you first took the job on um no it's an unbelievable summer coming and then you've got the world cup at the end of all of that as you say um i don't know i, I just sort of all i really wanted to do was to see the mindset change. I think the mind is a powerful thing if you can change that. And to me, the results are irrelevant a little bit. They help and they keep you in a job. Don't get me mm. wrong. But for me, it's like, can those players go out there and enjoy it? Can Brendan McCullum, Ben Stokes, Matthew Mott, Joss Butler, which the white ball team has done. And we always end up talking about the test team because that's where the biggest gain has been. The white ball team, we've done this. Um, so to me, it's like, just as long as they're doing that, as long as they're, you know, being brave in the way that they're committing to the the way that they want to play, then that'll do for me, really. You know, this is a bloody good Australian team that will be coming up. It's a bloody good New Zealand team. Before that, you've obviously got Ireland as well, probably at Lords, well, at Lords. There's so much cricket to come, but as long as they're committing to that style and the way, that mindset that I think you can be successful, that'll do. Because what happens is, Butch, you know, you have these sort of finite ends to everything, but you've just got to keep thinking, you just got to keep living every day by the way you want to do something, the style you want to do, and then it keeps on going. And it's not defined, oh, you know, if I get the words out, it's not defined by the result at the end of it. You just got to keep on anteing up and giving it a go. Well, it seems like a good enough place to end it. I mean, you've been very brave um, taking on the role in the first <laughs> place, and that, that bravery certainly has paid off and uh, very much to the... Uh, to the not to the detriment, I was going to say <laughs> very much to uh, to the positive uh, end for for English cricket and and long may it continue. Thanks for talking with Cheers, Butch. <laughs> that was a great interview, Joe. It was your idea originally to get Mark to speak to Keith. It was my idea, Phil. It was your idea originally. It was my idea. <laughs> it was. It wasn't. We had a conversation on the phone, and I said that's that's a Mark Butcher gig, and you said yes, yeah, good idea, and then you ran ran with it from there. This is how the magazine works. <laughs> did, did, you, did you dispute that? It wasn't. It was great. I, th I thought it was a really good idea to get Mark to do the interview to speak to Rob. Um, and I think that comes across in the interview as well. They've been friends for years um, and Rob's very relaxed. Yeah, I mean, that was definitely the thinking behind it. They've known each other for you know, a quarter of a century. They were Butch remembers playing against the 20 year old Key at Tunbridge Wells in 1999. And then when it comes full circle at the end of their career, Key's captaining Kent in Butcher's last ever game at the Oval. Butch actually remembers Key bowling off spin to him in his final afternoon as a professional cricketer before they shook hands on a draw and said it was not the most auspicious of finishes to uh, to his uh, uh, career. And obviously then, yeah, we, we get the bits afterwards with, well, they were England teammates, of course, before that. Um, and then they become... I think Butch said quite, quite a bit closer during the Sky gigs, spent a lot of time together and then golf buddies. And yeah, I, you know, we, we thought that they would, Butch would probably get a bit cut through that one of us as, as just kind of journalists might not. And I think that definitely came through in in the chat. Although saying that, 
Key is so relaxed with, I think, pretty much all journalists that I, I think whoever did it would have got a good amount of stuff out of him. He's he's uh, refreshingly unguarded, and it's great to see, even in this role with the ECB as a, as a suit, uh, he kind of bulks himself when he says as an as a administrator, that's never something he thought he'd become, and he doesn't act like one, and I think that's almost his mm. greatest trait at this stage, and you can see why... McCullum and Stokes and everyone would enjoy working with him because yeah there's just it just cuts through the crap and that's uh, as I say yeah refreshing mm, and I guess one of the themes of this um, this era of English cricket is that you can do these jobs really really well without taking yourself particularly seriously and that does start with key yeah and I mean it absolutely you see that all the way through the England team at the moment and I think now it's so much McCullum and Stokes because they're they're front facing and you know they're the ones who Stokes is doing on the pitch McCullum is there in the dressing room but you know Key has played a huge huge role in this uh, he also credits Strauss as well and said what role he played in in setting the whole thing up but um, it's been an astonishing start to his tenure and you, you have to now it feels like a great gig but you have to go right back to the start of when he wanted to do it and think why on earth did he want that job and and Butch even said himself, he said, like, it seemed like a bizarre choice. Um, but I quote, but when you hear his reasoning, it makes perfect sense. He was unfortunate that his career at the top level wasn't longer. And he had this sense of unfinished business with English cricket. And I think that's hugely admirable that he he kind of put his head above the parapet for a job that um, now looks great, but did not look so great uh, this time a year ago. It does kind of feel like he's already completed it, if that makes sense. Given the position that England were in, They've done so well. It kind of feels like any success now, even though on paper it will be a bigger deal, isn't actually as impressive as what has already happened. He alludes to that at the end as well. On the one hand, he's massively looking forward to the upcoming year, but he also recognises that Ashes series and World Cup balls ups have felled many a leader in English cricket before, and it might be that his race is actually already completed. And he said his only real motivation... And it's an extraordinary line to say that results were almost irrelevant, but that's a straight quote. His only motivation was a change in attitude, a change in mindset, um, a change in philosophy, uh, a, a row back from the sort of sombre over-seriousness that marks professional sport. Uh, and to try and take it back to its elemental reasons, why you do it in the first place. It sounds really simple when you say it out loud uh, and logical from a psychological perspective if you're trying to just strip away pressure but it's still revolutionary to say it because professional sport at all levels across all the sports is marked by a kind of sort of stultifying seriousness turns out that if you strip that away then you play a liberated form of whatever sport you happen to be good at Mm. I thought the bit where he he talks about his own frustration. Actually, sorry, I'm thinking back to a previous interview. In a previous interview with me, he's talked about how frustrated he is with his own batting and that he overcomplicated things and thought too much about technique and it ended up hampering the natural fluidity with which he'd played as a kid. And you can see that in his philosophy now. He doesn't want young players to fall into the same trap of overthinking. He just wants them to go out and do what they're best at. And, you know, Harry Brook is probably the, the clearest example now of someone who almost doesn't seem to be thinking at all it's so instinctual is that a word yep <laughs> it's so instinctual um and it's and and we're starting to see it permeate through english cricket as a whole with the lions mm. with the women's team starting to see signs of it outside of this country as well uh it's a really really powerful message and i saw ben folks the other day saying it's a bit like playing club cricket I think we we mentioned that on the podcast quite recently as well, and there is that feel to it. You go, you're going out to just enjoy it and have some of the pressure and the burden taken off you. There's a gentle irony to this. It only just occurred to me really that Key in 2003, 2003, four was involved in that England side, and as we know, you know, he had some good days out. He made a double against a poor West Indies side, but still a double at Lords. Really good 90 odd the week after at Old Trafford to see see a run chase home. Made a good 80 at Joburg. Crucial 80. That yeah, was a big innings in a big game, yeah. Yeah, in that game that Hoggard ended up winning, but he set it up with Strauss in the first innings and then was jettisoned very soon after that. But this was under, of course, Fletcher at the time. And he was associated with the more extreme elements of Flintoff's personality. He was seen as one of the 
one of the drinkers, basically one of the boys alongside Harmison and Flintoff and so on. And there for a good time rather than a long one. Uh, and English cricket now has sort of embraced that, that sort of club ability, that brotherhood. You know, they've been playing golf for two weeks and they go and win a test match by 300 runs at, in New Zealand. First one in 15 odd years or whatever it is. That's the way they tend to do it now. Stokes literally said last summer, if you don't want to have a net, don't have a net. Um, I'm not having one. And, and that's their attitude now. And obviously, you know, they enjoy themselves when they, when they win as well. And it, again, it sounds like, like some atavistic throwback to, to the, you know, the golden age, to the amateur years. But it turns out that it actually helps if you have really good cricketers on the park in the first place. And Key, Key was almost too... Uh, he had too much personality when he played for England. And he didn't, he didn't just sit in and behave himself and appear to knuckle down a little bit more because he'd have probably played a lot more, t- more test cricket. I know Steve Waugh was a big fan of his when he went out there and toured their 0-2-3. Um, and as I say, he was probably got rid of a little bit too quickly. Mm. Um, in, the, in the magazine feature, Joe, it includes uh, a, a mini piece by you with your reflections of Key. Oh, kind lovely. of knowing him um, for, for 20 or so he years. He didn't want to write it, you know. Really? No, he didn't want to write it. He thought it would, I don't know, cheapen the... <laughs> The piece it definitely but, uh, adds to it. Was it was more that it was you know is it really about me but and it's not clearly <laughs> but but I, I, in the end phil convinced me because i thought what it did show was how he's still pretty much the same bloke as he was that so can i grew up in canterbury uh it's a very small place there's only so many places you can go out but t- t- i i was there to watch keys one day debut for kent in 1998 he just won the under 19 world cup uh and he was up against uh, South Africa's first choice attack and hit a run ball 50 on his debut and I was, I was 13 at the time but actually it's one of those innings that stuck in my mind because he just played so well talk about playing simply in, in an uh, in uncomplicated way that was that innings perfectly just came out and played his shots uh, and then over the next couple of years he scored a load of county runs and was being talked about as kind of the next young English batter coming through and yeah, like I say, Canterbury is a small place. When I was started going on nights out, you would, you would, we'd bump into the players. You'd go to a club, you'd have Murray Litherin standing next to you in the queue. It was just just weird. But that's, I mean, I think I suppose that's true of probably Chelmsford and Leicester and all these places. But when you have overseas players turn up, they're just out clubbing with with, with all the other. The Prince of Orange Boozer just off Molesham Street in Chelmsford. That was the one. That was Del Pringles local. <laughs> and it's just weird because obviously a lot of my friends had no idea who these people were. And I'm like, that's the best bowler who's ever lived. He's just getting a double <laughs> vodka red bull. <laughs> 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 um, but anyway, so I, I saw Key in one of his clubs in, I think it must have been, yeah, it would have been, I think the summer of 2002. And he'd started scoring quite a lot of runs and with a charged with a few pints, probably I went up and said, I, I think you're going to the ashes this winter. And he's like, no, mate, I'm, too much booze, too many fags, no chance. They don't like me. Haven't got a look in. Then a few months later, he's picked for the home series against India. Does go on that Ashes tour and in a pretty miserable tour. Actually does okay. The, the stats weren't great, but he played the quicks well. Got bowled by Damian Martin, didn't he, at, at Perth? Something like that. He, when he, he got out to Martin and another crap medium pace. Yeah. So he, that was kind of the theme. He'd, he'd got through the quicks and then got out to a innocuous medium pace. Again, maybe overthinking it perhaps. Um, and then I saw him the following Easter at the at Canterbury's Polo Farm where they have a kind of infamously boozy uh, hockey festival and I was probably pissing him off but he, he was very kind about it I know and I reminded him of our bet he, he paid up very cheerfully uh, and how much I, was it? Uh, I think it was a tenner solid it wasn't loads it wasn't loads mm. uh, and then my mate Nick promptly threw up on the floor right next to him as well which <laughs> kind of sum, <laughs> sums up Polo Farm Canterbury Hockey Festival and uh yeah, and so you're from well, Polo Farm, <laughs> Canterbury Hockey Festival, my word. Uh, so yeah, you'd, you'd just you'd see him about, and then you know, I'd, obviously years later, I started interviewing him several times, and he, and even up to the the chat with Butch in the ECB boardroom as the managing director of England men's cricket, he's still pretty much the same bloke. And I, I I do think that is. I wonder if this might actually cause a shift, not only in Red Bull cricket and the philosophy of the way people play, but in the way people think about administrators and what, what people want out of administrators these days. Mm. Um, I'm not saying Key could be ECB chairman or chief exec. Those are probably different roles that need to be done by different people. But but these kind of roles, I think having a kind of, uh, like an everyman who has a connection to the players without being in the changing room all the time. And he was quite, he made that point as well. I'm not, not getting involved in that too often. But I think 
I think players respect that. I don't, I don't think he'll be doing the job this time in two years for sure. Maybe even this time in a year. Which way do you think he'll go? I think he'll go back to the telly. He'll go back to the telly with his stock higher than ever before. It's, it's As he says, it's the best job going. Uh, and if he can leave an Ashes win, a decent World Cup show, and he's already left his mark profoundly on the whole scene. He's already got a World Cup under his belt. Uh, if he can walk away with one of the next two, uh, then that is un- that's an untouchable stint. Mm. And it can only go one way from there on, and it can only get stale from there on. As Pitch says, crack open the cigars and, and, and put your feet up. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And and I think that that notion that... and it, it, I mean, you sort of alluded to it earlier, Joe, but the, the specific idea that Strauss has left his mark... Sorry, if you're looking at, say, the sky box, right? The commentary mm. box... Hussein's left his mark, Atherton's left his mark, Butcher's played 70 test matches, Strauss, who drifts in and out of it, he's played 100 test matches, Broad, who is obviously you know the next, next man, man in, in, et cetera, et cetera. And he said he, he had unfinished business with English cricket, that he'd been on the edges of it, on the mm. outskirts of it. And the, and it'd, be, it'd have been paid very handsomely to do the Sky gig. And as we know, it's it's a plum, plum job, to say the least. And he does like, his his links courses and all the rest of it before rocking up of an evening to do a bit of provincial provincial T (laughs) twenty and and his hockey festivals (laughs) at Polo Farm. Uh but he said no, no, I'm I'm gonna dive in. It could go tits up, could go horribly wrong. Um but I'm gonna take it on and and I think he'll naturally go back to that world in due course. It's hard to see him going the other way and ending up at the ICC, isn't it? I mean he doesn't even the only bits where he's a bit, you'd say, weaker in the interview are when Butch pushes him on the kind of bigger global game stuff. And and he says, honestly, like, you know, I don't know. We need the brightest people in the room. And he doesn't even proclaim to be one of those people. So it's hard mm. to see him ending up in Dubai. I just don't think that's that's not his interest, is it? No, nobody knows the answer to this question, do they? What, 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 what can we do about the Test Match game? He's, he's aware that you need to have more than three T's playing it. And, but it is... I, I agree. It's, that's the bit of the interview where he's 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 least uh, he has the least conviction, I guess. Where he, he's he's unsure about the direction of travel there. But also, I'm I'm listening to that, thinking, well, if if you're not sure and you're the managing director of director of England men's cricket, I'm not really sure how many people will be. Yeah, well, Butch pushes him, doesn't he? And he says, well, you know, if England, Australia, and India are the ones that want to play this, then isn't it up to them to put their money where their mouth is and and you know and make sure this thing continues mm. to work and that's probably the only question in the whole interview that key ducks a little bit. And mm. I think it's probably because he just doesn't know the answer or doesn't feel like it's just not his remit. And I don't you know what would that even look like? It's a, it's a really hard thing to, mm. to imagine. He, he, he does refute the doom, the doomsday uh, scenario that Butcher sort of presents mm. a little bit because he says, well, what's really happening is that the game is going to become the most popular it's ever been before. And there's more avenues open and more opportunities there for fans as well as players. Uh, that's the only moment in it where he maybe tiptoes towards establishment think, you know. Um, but on that level, he's not wrong. He's not wrong. But we all know that what that there is a significant consequence of this this opening up of the game and prioritising of its shortest forms. We know the, the impact that that's having. Do you remember when he was appointed and um, I think they were talking about, I think the first reports that McCullum was going to get the coaching job. One of your mates texted you saying that isn't this just like blokes you'd, you'd want to spend an evening in the pub mm. with. I can kind of got this vision of the World Test Championship final. Key just has a chat with the BCCI bosses and the Cricket Australia bosses like, come on, lad, let's go to the Fentimans. <laughs> <laughs> Thrash it all out <laughs> and let's just sort Test cricket. Come on. Um, oh, that'd be nice. Yeah, it's probably worth touching on the the sort of mini section where he discusses county cricket as mm. well, because I'm sure fans of county cricket will be alarmed to hear Key saying, "I think there should be less red ball cricket," and he acknowledges that that's not going to be popular with the vast majority of county fans. But again, I think you know he's a he is a pragmatist thing as well, and and he sees the hundred as a way of funding the stuff that created him that and he wants he, he wants the, the smaller counties the less fashionable counties to continue and thinks this is the way to do it now other people will have very strong opinions that that isn't the case 
Um, but I thought to again to put his head above the parapet and say I think we should have less red ball cricket, which is in direct opposition to Ben Stokes, who who has said very clearly he thinks there shouldn't be, albeit he's not playing much of it. So it's you know I'm not. It's also Keith said the same thing when he was on Sky. So this is not like he's put a suit on mm. and an ECB badge and now he's towing the line because he was saying the same thing beforehand. And it's always, it's always a carried. real cynic would say that Sky is an, is an <laughs> addendum anyway of the ECB. But he's always been consistent on that. Uh, the, the, the daylight between him and Stokes on it is that Stokes probably doesn't know the sort of financial real politic of, of, of the, the county game. He probably isn't scouring the the financial books and you know the checks and balances of, of put upon counties he's looking at it from a purely cricketing perspective whereas key now knows the ins and outs of the county game and key's always when when he's talked about the county game there's always been an additional weight there because compared to even the other sky pundits he had a much closer relationship with county cricket he right. played until the, the the bitter end almost uh, and a very active captaincy at Kent, etc. I think um, if you compare it to, say, Strauss, though, who gets a lot of criticism for so- as someone who, well, he just doesn't care about county cricket. It was never really his thing. Like, he did it for a bit, then he got big with England, and then it never really mattered to him again, hmm. which I don't think is actually a fair representation anyway. But that, you know, that is one argument that's made. You could never say that about Key because he hmm. was basically county cricket. Like, he, he didn't play for England for the last, kind of, what, decade of his county career outside from being in... The world well, T20 well, yeah. batting at number seven in a, against the <laughs> Netherlands for one game. So like this stuff really, really matters to him. And he is, whatever you think about his views, he is coming at it from the point of view of how do we make this thing continue to work for as long as it possibly can. Mm. He's and not the, dismissing it. Yeah, and exactly. And there's pride as well. When he talks about Harry Brook, he says, look, he's not come through any other system. He's come through our system. He's come through the English county system. And so there's a total recognition that it's... You know the key part of the whole English ecosystem, mm. but the world is hurtling by at the same time. Mm. Um, before we get to the rest of the magazine, we'll run through uh, a few bits of cricket that have happened since Monday's pod. So this morning it was announced that at the age of forty, Jimmy Anderson is now the number one ranked Test bowler in the world, <laughs> overtaking Pat Cummins and staying a couple of points above Ashwin. Um, what well, comes a huge surprise that he's the oldest person ever to do it. Phil, you said a few months ago that he might be the Britain's greatest ever sports person, full stop. Did I? Um, you did, yeah. Um, Blimey. He's, he's definitely in the conversation. <laughs> definitely was that in the pub or on the podcast? Definitely you. Definitely you. Well, and it was on the podcast as well. I'm wait, sure someone will have to point He's got out. a case, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he does have a case. That's, a case. that's why I brought it up. Um, the T20 World Cup semi finalists are confirmed. Australia play India on Thursday, England play South Africa on Friday. England hammered Pakistan in their final group game yesterday. Their total of 213 for five is the highest ever in a women's T20 World Cup game. Nat Siver Brunt hit 81 not out of 40 balls. She is in very, very good form. She um, is a class apart. England rested Lauren Bell. Freya Davies came in the side did okay. Then quite importantly for the semi-finals, Catherine Siver Brunt had her best game of the tournament so far, taking two for 14 of her four overs. Um, and also Danny Wyatt found some form as well. Um, there were a couple of questions about Wyatt and Siverbrunt, Kat- Catherine and Siverbrunt on the last podcast, and both of them found form. Um, Joe, you weren't on Monday's pod, but England are actually looking pretty good, and the, the John Lewis era is starting very well. Yeah, looking powerful. John Ball has to be banned, though. <laughs> that is just the worst thing I've ever heard. I mean, it's, it's, it's creeping in. Ebony said it on commentary. Um, I've seen references to on Twitter. That needs, to, that needs to stop. Yeah. Uh, but they're playing some great cricket, certainly. And the balance of their side looks the best I've ever seen it. Mm. The, the, the way that the balance of the bowling attack, the three spinners, one of each um, style. Um, big that Catherine Siverbrunt was was back to somewhere near her best against Pakistan, albeit a, it was an odd game because it was very watchable because England played, batted so beautifully. But it was kind of grimly one-sided and it was one of those ones where the w- wheels really came off mm. for Pakistan. As Phil says, that Siverbrunt just, she keeps taking it up another level um it, it's it does feel like we've got to that point you know we shouldn't jump the gun they both have to win their semi-finals but i do expect england to beat south africa reasonably comfortably I'd be very surprised if australia don't beat india it's sort of then can that silver brunt do it again against australia and everyone mm. else do enough to beat them I, I i can't really see them beating australia without without that yeah. having a massive contribution and even if she does we saw in the last world cup final she couldn't have contributed much more and they still lost australia definitely favorites we i know we keep saying that but it does feel like the gap is as small as it has been for quite a long time that gap is still big but it does feel that um i remember when england were in the west indies just before christmas 
England kept winning against a very weak West Indies side, but they weren't winning convincingly. They weren't threatening these kind of scores. Um, and then, as you say, the balance of the team is is as, as good as it's been in years. Yeah, the w- one thing I would say, they, they lost early wickets against India and kept going hard. They lost early wickets against Pakistan and kept going hard. And that's great. That's the way they want to play. I don't know if you can do that against Australia in the same way because Amy Jones has barely made a run against Australia across her career. Looks in great touch. But you don't want her in in the seventh, eighth over. You don't want Heather Knight in in the power play. So they've they've got to keep going the way they have. But I do fear if they lost those early wickets, then it might kind of fall to pieces quite quickly. And on that, the top three have obviously got immense amounts of talent, and they've had their days out all each individually across the tournament. But they haven't clicked together yet very much, as in Dunkley, Wyatt, and Capsey. Um, Dunkley looked a bit out of out of touch, I thought, against Pakistan. A couple of technical things creeping in. Uh, and Capsi looked a little bit not quite herself as well. It might just be a one-off for sure. But that is a dangerous but flimsy top three, I think. Um, you never know, though, that what that might mean is that they all they all come off together. Mm. Uh, but that would be that would be a little concern for me if they do get through that semi and end up playing, playing the big guns in the final that it does feel a little bit hit and miss and possibly slightly slightly on the miss side at the moment, that top mm. three. But we shall see. Um, as we mentioned already, the new Wisden Cricket Monthly is out now. Joe, aside from that interview with Key, what are the, what are the highlights? Felt like a busy one going through it as we sent it to print. Um, lots in there. There's a really nice interview with Jack Leach by Jim, who spoke to, spoke to Leach whilst he was in New Zealand ahead of the first test. Um about feeling the most comfortable he's ever felt in an England shirt and fighting his more conservative instincts to kind of join the party, essentially. Uh, There's a nice bit where he was surprised to see how many test wickets he'd taken last year, which actually I, I, I was as well. And it's like, well, because his average wasn't great, mm. but he was like, I never thought I could have taken that test, many test wickets and, and go for the runs that I did. Um so that's, that's a good one. Um, Matt Roller's done a really good piece on the first 15 years of the IPL, the kind of defining moments of the, uh, of the tournament so far, and then looked ahead to the, the 16th edition, which is just around the corner. Uh, Phil did a nice photo led piece on the greatest ever slip fielders, mm. for the one for the purists. Like <laughs> uh, all my work. <laughs> and tried to unpick what's going on at Essex, which is... Not an easy task because it's it's moving along. Well, it's not moving along quickly, but there's a lot to come. And we had the announcement just the other day that the chairman has moved on already. Yeah, yeah, they, they were gagged from talking about that legally when when we we had to, when we went to press and there was talk that they may have had an announcement regarding the chairman before we went to press. In the end, it was delayed, so there wasn't much on the specifics of that unfortunate case, but. As John Stevenson, the boss there, said, it's it's the toughest, hardest, and most complex thing that he's had to confront because mm. it it's not just a question of a cricket club; it's a, it's it's the question of the day, really. Um, and construing social media posts and what they what they tell you about that these individuals um, lies at the heart of much of the much of the, the these explosive issues uh, that are rightly being addressed in English cricket. Mm. Um, uh, but you know, people will have read about Azim Akhtar, the, the chairman who's now lo- no longer involved at the club. That have read about his particular case, and they make their own decisions on that. They make mm. their own ju- judgments on it. On um, on Leach, I've not I've not read the interview, but I I, re- I really want to. I think it's I think it's fascinating. I think him and folks, kind of the the least basball of the basballers, um, how they go about their cricket, I, f- I find very interesting. I think with Leach, he deserves a bit of credit because we've not been the most complimentary of him at times over the last year. I think he deserves a lot of credit uh, for just the holding role he has with the bowlers they specifically have in the team. They don't really have seamers who are that who are capable of bowling long spells at the moment. Anderson's forty, Broad's thirty six. Robson doesn't really bowl long spells, and Stokes' knee's gone. Le- the role Leach has to kind of just pause the game at points when teams are. Can't, it is difficult for him to be attacking because teams are looking to attack him as well. He does have like an oddly crucial role, even though the average is actually worse than it was before Stokes was captain, which I think people would be su- surprised by. Yeah, and he just knows whatever the conditions he's going to get picked now. And that, mm. that wasn't the case for a, 
a long, long time. I mean, the the kind of normal mode was to not pick him, and then they'd pick him if they thought it would spin a bit. And obviously, that's been turned completely on its head. Mm. Um, and you spoke to Joe Root's dad. Spoke to yeah, Matt Root, Joe's dad, and Billy, his brother, um, about how Joe became quite so good, really, and uh, some of the bumps in the road along the way, and there were some, even if it might not feel like it now. And um, the most kind of moving bit of it was them both talking about the end part of Joe's test captaincy and, and how it affected him and, and just how much happier he seems now with that burden lifted off his shoulders. Um, so yeah, that was, I enjoyed doing that one. Um, we did a piece warming up for the county season by looking at the greatest post-war championship campaigns from a team perspective um, with, you know, Surrey's brilliant year being the starting point for that and seeing how some of the, some others compare with it. Um, and got some good we've got Isha Guha as a guest columnist looking at the women's super league and the, the great opportunities out there for women's cricket and how that landscape is shifting great stuff from Andrew Miller Lawrence Booth Adam Collins and we'll have Mark Rampakash returning as a columnist from next month in time for the new season as well so it'll be mm. good to have him back on board and the batting coaches oh, Ollie yeah. Pope yeah so Ollie Pope's one of our uh, coaching team if you like one of nine or ten names a uh, mixture of coaches and current players. And he does a brilliant, um, he answers a question from a reader regarding uh, how to manipulate the spin in particular and how to inject a bit more power into your shots when you're not maybe the biggest. And obviously this mm. taps into his own game and he's super, superb on it. I think he spoke to Joe at sort of half seven in the morning. It from was, yeah. I mean, real New Zealand. Real commitment. And I've it, got to say, he's too good and established to talk to you, a journalist, even if it is you. You're going to say me. <laughs> even if it is you, <laughs> Joe. Uh, at half seven in the morning. It's not the making of an next England test captain, it's is it? Not, no, you need to be aloof, a little bit arrogant and slightly highfalutin. Do you reckon Harry Brook would pick up the phone to talk no about No chance. <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely anyway, not. He <laughs> but I'm very grateful to Ollie, I should say. Yeah, he's a, he's a star uh, and, and jumped at the chance, weirdly, to be a part of this. Was it 7.30am New Zealand time or UK time? Uh, New Zealand time. Okay, wow. Fair yeah. play. Fair Impressive. play. He's probably been to the gym, done 20 lengths. Anyway, he... he, he <laughs> It's a really, really revealing piece by him. Um, if you are a player and if you are interested in the, the science of, of batting, then you've got to read it, really. And then Toby Radford, who's, who's, who's a very, very good batting He's been coach. on the pod before and he helped me fix my issue of um, collapsing over to the offside when trying to hit it through the leg side. Right. Was that a defining moment in your batting career? Uh, did you... I did actually... Get up to 30? I, no, I didn't quite. I got up to 20-odd the next week. So, kind of, Yeah. So he he's a former West Indies batting coach and is a is a very well respected, uh, world renowned batting coach, batting specialist coach, and uh, he's outlined the best pre season drills that that you can do to get in in Nick for the start of the new season. So if you are, you know, getting your bat down from the loft and brushing off the mothballs and all the rest of it, and you are thinking, all right, well, one more circuit, let's get going. Then I really can recommend those two pieces. They're really mm. useful. And it's worth a reminder on, on the Ollie Pope piece that, that he was directly responding to a question that a reader sent in saying the question was he was a slight bloke who was struggling to get the ball off the square against the spinners. Um, and, you know, Pope seemed like a good person to answer that because he's, he's, you know, he's got small stature himself, uh, which is actually pretty cool if you think about it. You've got a reader asking England's number three how you play spin and mm. he gets right back to you, basically. Yeah. So if people have got questions email in editorial at wisdom.com and mm -hmm. we'll put them to you can ask either for a specific specific member of our coaching team or we can figure out who we think would be best mm. to answer it and and i think i don't think um i think it is possible for someone just to send in a video of them playing as well I yeah mean, absolutely player no that would be that would be helpful yeah. and we can send those, those on to the coaches and they can give us give us their tips mm -hmm. um well as always you can get the latest magazine at wisdom.com forward slash shop um Cheers, Phil. Cheers, Joe. This has been the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. We'll be back next week for uh, after the World Cup final and the next England-New Zealand Test match.